Hungry Trilobite podcast would like to start by acknowledging SoonerCon. Get ready for the next chapter in Oklahoma's longest-running fan-run pop culture convention. SoonerCon will be returning in 2024, June 21st through 23rd. Get ready for a weekend of cosplay, fun and excitement, vendors, gaming, and more. You can go to SoonerCon.com for more information. On tap today, we have John Billingsley coming on back, but we have two new guests as well. I'm going to go ahead and let you guys introduce yourselves. Natalia, you take it away. <laughs> hey, everybody. My name is Natalia Castellanos. I'm a sag after member, an actor, and also a part of the TV Theatrical Negotiating Committee this year. And I'm Jonathan Delarco. I'm also a sag after member and an actor of over uh 38 years someone asked me the other day how many years i've been doing this Whoa. 38 oh ouch <laughs> you're a baby you're a baby uh, no. sure john <laughs> sure uh, i'm john billingsley and uh we're here today to talk about united we trek and united we trek is uh a component of the ongoing sag after a brighter strike that is going on right now and right now being september of 2023 if you're getting this a bit after the fact here uh united we trek is a really exciting component of this and uh why don't i go ahead and let you guys explain it because you guys are right in the fields and in the trenches great jonathan do you want to kick us off sure uh let's see a little quick backstory back in may when the writers were went, first went on strike i went to help and pick it and we were outside Paramount, and one of the strikers recognized me as an actor from a certain franchise, which we'll be referring to very, very frequently because we do not talk about shows we were on. We did not promote them while we're on strike. So they said, hey, you're that guy from that certain franchise. And I said, yes. And they said, we're going to do a picket that's just around that franchise on such and such a date. Do you want to come? I said, sure. Matter of fact, I'll email my friends. So I came home and I emailed John and I emailed a bunch of my friends Long story short, those pickets used to get maybe 50 people at a, on a good day, the writer's strike. Um, that day of the certain franchise picket, we saw 500 to 1,000, which was astonishing. So cut to us on strike months later, I run into John on the picket line and he goes, let's do one for us this time. So that's kind of how it happened. And then the, and then we, we we were talking and said, well, should we invite the fans? And then it became about inviting the fans. So this is kind of how how it took off. I'd really like to emphasize that that is possibly one of the most important things we're wanting to do is to, because this is a picket as opposed to a presentation, there's no podium, no speeches, there's no cap on the number of people we can have attend. And we'd really like to encourage any fans who are in the Los Angeles area to join us on the 8th between 10 and noon at either Paramount in Los Angeles, or 9.30 to noon in New York at Paramount, 1515 Broadway, to become part of the experience. What we want to try and do is say through our effort that on blank blank day, hosted by Paramount, to celebrate the franchise, we would like to bring everybody together to say, actually, the franchise is us. It's not the suits. It's not the studios. It's the creators and the crew and the fans all together. And we'd like to kind of bring that awareness into the world on that day. I really regret that I'm in completely the wrong time zone. Otherwise, I would definitely be there. But if you're getting this right off the feed when it hits the internet, you yourself have about 24 hours to plan your trip there. So please, <laughs> if you can make it there, go ahead. And there are things we'd like to talk about as we continue having this conversation. Um, other ways that we think the fans, and I know this has been a kind of an overriding question in, in the fan universe, is how can they support us? Um, I'd love to have Natalia talk a little bit about why they should support us, why we are striking, and then turn around again to even if you can't make it on the Friday, thinking about things you can do to make your voice heard. I think one of the things that's happening is that the people who, the AMPTP, the people who kind of started all this, are realizing that they are surprisingly not the heroes in this morality play. They are being perceived as the villains. And I think the extent to which the fan base can continue to clamor, stop this, come back to the negotiating table, let's have some common sense here, we might move to a conclusion a little bit faster. 
Yeah, totally. And, you know, there there's so many things that we're, we're fighting for, of course, this time around, right? Things that haven't changed in 40 years in our contract. We are working on a very old model of a contract with new distribution models that the AMPTP has created, which is streaming. And the thing with with streaming is that our actors, all of us, we make most of our money um, through residuals. Every time our, our, you know, projects air, we get a piece of the pie. But the problem with streaming is that ever since they did that, we're getting zero dollars or one cent check or three cent check that we've seen. We can't survive. So what we're asking for and what we're fighting for this time around are things like minimums. We are asking for a, a piece of the pie and residuals for streaming. We are asking for to be able to uh, get more money in that aspect so that 86% of us are not suffering and not being able to make our health insurance. And just to qualify for health insurance, that's $26,470 yearly. And 86% of our members don't have that. Um, and things like AI, which is a, an existential threat to us because what they are trying to do is pay us for half a day and then use our likeness and our voice and uh, you know our image and put it into many different franchises without consent and without compensation. So there are guardrails that we're trying to put in place so that our members actually can make a living and be, you know, sustainable at doing their job. There are That's huge. There are 160,000 people in SAG. And I think the misperception is that most of the people in SAG are celebrities who are doing very well. Most of the people in SAG are middle to lower middle class. And if you imagine what an actor's life is like in any given year, you may work two, three, maybe four times. If you are lucky, you are making twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars from those jobs, maybe. You're hoping that your residuals make up the difference. That's what allows you to actually be able to afford a house and to live in the most expensive city in the country. When that residual stream dwindles to the point it has dwindled now, it does not allow for the possibility of people to survive in this business. And I think for myself and possibly for Jonathan, I'm 63. I'm on the line because this next generation of actors and artists coming up, striving to have professional lives, they're going to give up. They're going to throw in the towel. They're going to say, what's the point? I can't make a living. So really, we are fighting for the survival of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what value, that's the fundamental to me value of Star Trek. Star Trek believes in the concept of everybody coming together to protect and create a civilization. And I think the civilization that is our industry right now, the people who are at the helm of it are not thinking about the ecosystem. And the the four of us that put this together, including Michelle Hurd, who's who's the vice president of, of SAG, um, we really feel like uh, the audience has a vested interest in entertainment continuing to be a part of the world, right? The national picture, but the world. I mean, you all remember what got us through the pandemic. We're binging all those shows that we hadn't watched on all the, the streamers. And, you know, I think that, that entertainment serves a really very big purpose to educate, to edify, to make life better for people and to entertain and I think like letting the fans into this conversation is an important piece that has not happened yet in the strikes. The strikes have stayed very centric to the workers affected. And I think it's high time for the fans to be heard and to uh, have a part of the conversation. So, and, and as we all know, the lineage of this franchise's fan base saved the show in the 60s and has been, has been the most loyal fan base any show has ever had. So I'm excited that they happen to be. If you cut out on us, Jonathan. And I, you know, to add on to what Jonathan just said, you know, I think a lot of people, and something that John said is everybody thinks it it is Hollywood, just Hollywood, but it actually, it's a, such a ripple effect, right? What, our productions bring to every single city that becomes a production hub are, you know, business to small businesses, to the restaurants, to the um, dry cleaners, to coffee shops, to hotels. And all of that now is suffering because this small group of elite uh, CEOs don't want to share a piece of the pie. And a thing that, you know, John was stating about 
you know, his age and where he's at with healthcare, right? If you think about it, as soon as John turns 65 years old and he starts taking a pension, what happens right now is that that person is not able to take uh, is not able to qualify through healthcare using residuals. They only can qualify through session payments. So that means it's going to be a lot even uh, much harder for John to qualify if he's not working with good pay, just even on the baseline. Yeah. I, I also want to kind of talk a little bit about the nature of what, what a lot of people are calling the, the hot labor summer. Um, you know, there was a time in America when a third of the labor force was unionized. And that has diminished and diminished, diminished down the years. And not surprisingly, we've also seen that people's standard of living has diminished. Once upon a time, people had defined benefit pensions. Once upon a time, people had health care provided by their employer. Obviously, a lot of the world has changed because of globalization and because of the fact that manufacturing is under, under a great deal of threat in America, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But some of it was a conscious choice to diminish the power of unionism, a conscious choice to try and suppress the ability of labor unions to organize and fight for a fair deal. And I think one of the things that is really important is for us to be viewed as um, a point of a spear. I really think that one of the strengths of our union is that we are willing 98% of our union voted for this strike is that we are in in um, as solid as I've ever seen us. And I've been in this union for over 40 years. We are fighting for things that every working man in America cares about. The ability to make a living wage at what you've chosen to do with your life. And I feel like a lot of people might be tempted to dismiss that because they have no interest in being in, in creative fields. And that's that's their prerogative. But I think what we're not really talking about as much is that the AI component that Natalia mentioned before is potentially going to affect anybody's livelihood. Any case where somebody is trying to inject AI into an industry that is not ready for it, does not need it, will not benefit from it at the expense of people, is potentially another job that's going to be taken away somewhere else. So oh, it's kind of fortunate that yeah. this happened in this case where we can see it. I'm sorry to tell you. No, I was I'm sorry to cut you off. Yeah, I I you you're completely right with that, right? We already see it in things like supermarkets. Mm -hmm. You go to a supermarket and now we don't have cash registers. You go to these big, you know, Home Depot or Lowe's or any of those, also there's this self-checkout and that's losing jobs in in that aspect. It's huge. And here's the thing. If you're not interested in in entertainment, you got to think back a little bit because Jonathan did bring it to what happened during COVID. What happens when we as humans go through something? We wanna connect with other humans. We wanna be seen, we wanna be heard and understood. And what do we go to is our TV and our film and our music and our to our artists. So this really is about everybody, yeah. not just us. And you know, there's, it's interesting because I think one of the things that's tricky is that we need to recognize, that even as consumers, do we really want to live in a world in which we do not engage with human beings? As you say, when you go into the supermarket and you can self check out, when you call somebody on the phone in customer service and you get an automated service, uh, we're going to have self driving trucks, self driving cabs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera or, or automated. I mean, I think there's a place at which we as human beings have to say if you remove the human component, from the world, if you remove labor, uh, uh, is that the world you want to live in? And, and yes, we are very much facing that in our industry. If they can conjure my face, my voice, a performance from, from existing images of me, if they can do things digitally, they don't need me. That, that's, that's really, we are fighting for, I, I think, an issue that concerns everybody in America and everybody in the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, my John, friend a, my friend had a really funny picket sign that said, if my AI is taller than me, I already hate him. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and one of the one of the streamers has a, a show, uh, which mm -hmm. also shall not be named. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an anthology. And one of the episodes literally takes somebody's and a person just out on the street, somebody's image and likeness and creates their own thing and messes their life. So if you haven't checked it out, go check it Fantastic. out. Fantastic. Yeah. I know my AI is going to be skinnier than me. <laughs> <laughs> 
I just don't quite understand why people will spin this like it's a good thing. Like, I mean, John, just to use you as an example here, uh, when I would watch you on that show that I watched you on, uh, it would, I got what I got out of that because of your performance, what you brought to it, what you, your, the inflection you had in how you read the material, um, because I was getting that from somebody who knew what it was like to be afraid, to fall in love, to be, to have hate in you, to have love in you. It was one of those things that came about because you're a human being. I can, I can copy your mannerisms maybe digitally, but I'm not going to actually have a, a representation of what the material means. That's what one would hope that more people would would feel, but you know, it only takes a relatively small number of people to be fighting to create a technology that achieves a mechanical reproduction. For those of us who who, as as you just said, think that the human element is critical, to lose if we don't fight collectively. And I think technology is not. You're not going to be able to stop the technology. And obviously, I think in the field, for example, of science the AI technology is probably going to move us much further in, he in curing things. But in terms of entertainment, I I think at the end of the day, the audience is not going to prefer it to, uh, to a real human being. I just think it's cost effective for the studios to think, oh, look, I could own John and put him in a bunch of things and pay him a, a flat fee and... Uh, be able to make all this money. I mean, it comes down to money. They're making a lot of money. They're making a lot of money on us right now. I mean, I saw a tweet from one of the actors from Breaking Bad who said he's gotten zero checks from it running on Netflix. So, you know, that's what that's what's happening now already. You know, and again, I really want to marry us to the labor movement generally. If you look at the trucking industry, theoretically, the day is going to come. We see it now when you have self-driving automobiles, self-driving trucks. Every one of those truckers has a family, has a house, has a mortgage, has a life and a livelihood. If we continue to live in a society in which the people who run businesses say the most important thing is the investor class, the most important thing is our return, the most important thing is our profit, it's a labor force that is already suffering. People in this country, one in five American kids don't have to get up and worry about whether they're going to eat that day or what they're going to eat or when they're going to eat. We are the richest country in the world, but we are making choices right now in the way we in the way we embrace our technologies that are designed to reward a profit-making class at the expense of a laboring class. That's right. And we, we are one, one union, one business, one ecosystem, one segment. But I really want to communicate to people everywhere, think about your industry, think about your workforce, think about your labor realities, think about what would happen if something similar was happening in your field. And it will happen. It's just a matter of time and how. It's it's just weird and, and in some ways good that it happened in such a visible way in such a visible industry that the world looks at. If this happened in a, a more uh in a less popular, less visible industry, it wouldn't really be the conversation it is right now. Mm -hmm. On the flip side of that, on the positive side of that, because I think we are realizing that a lot of people are raising their hands and saying, you know, a wide a wide range of issues affecting labor. A lot of people are saying enough, enough. And I, I think that's one of the reasons that that our union is not going to fold, uh, that we are going to stay strong in this fight. Um, and I'd really encourage fans, if they're upset about this, if they're concerned about this, get on the phone, write a letter, contact a studio, contact a network. If you've got stock, not very many people in America hold stock, but for those who do, maybe in their 401ks, consider, do you have stock in Amazon? Do you have stock in Apple? Do you have stock in Disney? You're a stockholder. You own these companies. If this is of, a con is, if this is of concern, consider that as a share shareholder, you should speak up. That is a neat angle and I had to consider it all. And if you don't know if you have stock, a quick call to your financial planner, should you have one or anybody who serves that role would illuminate you on that. Yeah, because most people have a mixed portfolio and frequently they've got a bundled mm -hmm. portfolio of, of bits and pieces of a number of stocks. You know, you may hold stock in Exxon. You may also hold stock in a number of entertainment companies and you might not be crazy about what we're you know, seeing happen right now. And I think, you know, even that, that, whether you have stock or not, right? I think that's what what I love what John said because it's that's the power that we have that we often forget as humans that we think we have our hands tied and we do have the power to shift things. I mean, we saw it with this blank blank franchise 
right, that these two wonderful actors are on. And they saved the show so many years ago. And it can be done again because that is the power that we hold. And we have to remember that. Hmm. Natalia, that's a great point. And I actually wanted to bring that up earlier, but we just had so much really to going on there. But um, when I first heard about this event, I said to myself, well, that's, I'm glad it's happening, but I didn't necessarily expect this, this labor protest to be themed around this franchise. And then it suddenly made so much sense in that the fans of that franchise are going to support it. And it's, it puts a lie to the idea that, well, when these actors go to work, they're just getting a paycheck. No, they're using this to bind together for something more than that paycheck. They're using it to build a better life for themselves and for the rest of the labor movement. Mm -hmm. So much about what Star Trek means, I think, to to all of us who are in it. As somebody said the other day, one of the Lori Ulster, the wonderful Lori Ulster, uh, suggested that perhaps those of us who actually make the shows have a deeper understanding of what those shows mean and what the resonance is than the people who own them. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at the end of the day, right, like without the actors and the writers, I think John put this so eloquently, but I'm going to try to regurgitate it in, in the same way. But no, but no fan goes to go see the suits at, at on these shows, right? Or at conventions. They go to see these two wonderful actors because of what they brought, because of the life. And that's what we as actors do. That That is the importance. And that's why it is such a timely, you know, time in in the world right now with labor um we are important and art is labor and i never want to i don't want to demonize anybody in our industry because i really do believe it is a collective enterprise that's what star trek suggests when we hierarchalize when we say that somebody's more important than another as has been said that the amptp they're the ones who are taking all the risks i don't think that's true we are all in a risk-taking enterprise together it is a risk to become a professional actor we all have a stake in this the decisions that were made to create a streaming model were made independently of us. In a way, my feeling is, is the AMPTP has painted themselves into a structural corner. They're turning around and saying, you, the artists, are the ones who are going to have to pay for a mistake we made, even though we never consulted you in the first place about what we should have created. And it's one of the reasons this is taking a long time is because the structure itself has to be examined. As somebody who's very interested in politics, I think you could look at the structure of our country and say, to a certain extent, we are in a bit of a corner structurally in terms of how things work. And we can't come together and talk about that without yelling at each other. Let's get back to the table first and foremost. You know, ask the fans, right, which is one of the things I think we're wanting to do. Fans, just tell them to get back to the negotiating table because they have not said boo to us since we went on strike. Nope. I know I not being at the table myself i my understanding of this is extremely basic but i really do feel like this there's a lot of this that sounds familiar to the strikes that happened in the late 2000s and it really it seems like a pattern that one of the big topics there was proper nego proper residuals coming in from dvd sales and digital media sales and it seemed like as soon as that was settled that's when the streaming thing kicked in and it's very hard to not see that as being intentional and it's very hard to not see that as being a way to sidestep something that, yeah. As somebody who's been doing this for, for well, 50 years, really, uh, I, to me, every time a, a negotiation comes up, we're essentially told the same thing. It's like, well, this is kind of cutting edge. We don't know if it's going to work. We don't know if it's going to be actually lucrative. So mm -hmm. let's get, you know, take this kind of low ball contract. And when we find out whether this methodology, this delivery system, DVDs, cable television functions, then we'll make it right. Except by the time the next contract comes up, guess what? We're onto a new delivery system and the same story is told again. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've reached a breaking point where it's like, look, for 40 years, every time you've introduced a new delivery system, we've been screwed. Mm -hmm. We're seeing our we're seeing our ability to survive in this in this in this business diminish enough. And for somebody who might be in a position where their their income doesn't depend on residuals, it's very hard for them to relate. And all I can point to is say, Look how much money these franchises do make. Pick your franchise. I don't care which one it is. It makes a lot of money on a year-to-year -year basis. Why shouldn't that money go to the people who are responsible for it? It's, Everybody. It's also, it's also people don't necessarily, if they're not in our line of work, understand most people go to a job. 
And they have that job day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. It's the regularity and the predictability of the paycheck that allows them to have a life. We don't have that. We gamble. We gamble that we'll be able to work enough to survive. The residuals is the connective tissue that allows us to go through these long droughts in between gigs. There's so many of us competing for a relatively small number of jobs that there's no way any of us could survive without a residual structure. If you if you eradicated residuals and you said, okay, actors, it's just the job. That's what you got. Probably 80% of our union would have to quit doing this. Well, and what a lot of people that aren't actors don't really understand the day the day to day life of an actor that is successful, meaning they have an agent and they get opportunities, requires that person to learn and study and prepare reams of material for most of the times jobs they're not going to get. So I may get 10 pages of material that I'm not getting paid to spend three days working on and studying and learning and spending money on to put on tape, to videotape it, to send it, to send to casting directors. I do that all year long. That is my job. That is an unpaid part of my job. I don't get paid for that unless I get a residual for the job that I finally booked. So there's, uh, I tell it to, to people that are not in the profession, imagine having, having three or four job interviews in which you had to uh, know everything about the company once a week, you know, three times a week. That That is the struggle that we we put into our jobs, right? And a little perspective to even add on to that is look at any show that you would like. Just let's pick one episode of that show. All the actors that are hired there for speaking roles, even the person that says, uh, here's your coffee, sir, right? The one line. There are, for that one role, the here's your coffee, sir, they probably got anywhere between 2,000 and 5,000 submissions for that, for those roles. And now out of those 2,000 to 5,000 people that were submitted for that role, maybe let's say at the most 100 people got an audition. That's 99 people that did not get that job. And then all the other thousands of people that didn't even get that opportunity to do that. And that is part of the game. That is what we do in day in and day out is hope for that. How can we make connections? It, to it, that scene? It's an interesting exercise. If you go to IMDb, the internet movie database, and you look up just, let's say, uh, a season of Deep Space Nine or a season of, I won't mention the names of the shows, and you look at the cast and you go all the way through all the episodes of the season, you'll see that the seven or eight series regulars, of course, are in every episode, and then you'll see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of actors who did a line here, a scene here, a scene there. That's the union. Most of those people, you wouldn't you wouldn't know their names. You might recognize them on the street because you've seen them in a bunch of things, a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there. It's the residuals from those individual episodes that are the sinew of our business. Mm-hmm. And I, I was just on, I was on Suits. I had a couple of episodes of Suits, forgive me. I'm, I'm, I, it's very hard not to reference shows. But the point is that that's showing on Netflix right now. And more people are recognizing me from that than have recognized me in years from anything I've done. And I'm not going to get a penny out of it. Mm-hmm. Aaron Paul recently said, the show he was on, Breaking Bad. Mm-hmm. He it was, you know, brilliant on it. Second lead. It's been on Netflix now. So many people seeing it, not a penny he's seen from it. Well, they might give him a penny. <laughs> and there's nothing more exhilarating back for a than, penny. But nothing not more exhilarating than opening an envelope with a 48 cent stamp on it yeah. and seeing that you got a check for a penny. And uh, that's no joke, folks. We literally open entire envelopes that cost more to mail than what the, they actually write a check for a penny. We're not being facetious. Uh, there are, I have checks for pennies. I've had that a is, check for zero dollars. Zero dollars. Yeah. Why yeah. cut it? Yeah. yeah. Why cut it? <laughs> um, yeah. So in any case, just to come back to if you're in the New York or the L.A. area and you want to come out and join us, it's going to be a wonderful, exciting, animated. We are, I, I can say, all of us have been on the picket line quite a bit. We are we are approaching this with as much enthusiasm and joy and excitement as we can, given that it is a labor action and our lives and our livelihoods are at stake. But the unity, be part of it. Come and be part of it. We'd love to have you.
And for everybody that's going to show up and can show up, you know, definitely check in uh, at the tables that they have from either the WGA or SAG-AFTRA. Even if you're not a member, we want to, you know, get everybody that is there, um, you know, named out. Um, and then just make sure to bring water. R remember that this is a, a moving picket, so we have to keep moving because of the the laws of the, of each state, right, uh, that they, they make us keep moving. If not, we'll get tickets. We don't want tickets. Um, so, you know, but come have fun, wear sunscreen, bring water, and come and join us. And at least in L.A., consider taking Uber, Lyft, or public transportation because parking will be at a premium. Um, it's going to be, we hope, it's going to be very crowded. And if you want to bring your own sign, it will have to be vetted by one of our unions to make sure it's not mentioning individual shows or the franchise itself. But uh, we may not have enough labor signs to go around. It's okay to bring your own. We do ask people not to wear a costume. Um, we, we are we are trying to kind of do two things that seem sort of, you know, uh, disassociative. We are trying to say, uh, hey, blank, blank we're the ones at the same time we're trying not to say blank blank so as hard as that can be to kind of wrap your brain around i'm not very good at it but that's the goal well and september 8th has always been a celebration of this franchise it celebrates you know the first time it aired in 1966 which was the year i was born um and uh the company uh, that uh, owns it uses that day uh, very effectively to promote the franchise. So this is our way of taking it back for the fans to take it back. Um, so it's very significant. It should be very celebratory in a way in terms of our unity as uh, as a, a community, meaning the actors and the writers and the creatives and the fans being the community. And we've got some amazing people coming. You know, George Takei will be there, Jerry Ryan, Will Wheaton, LeVar Burton, the three of us, and I dare say 50 to 100 other Trek creatives will be present. So it's, it's a rare not, opportunity. It's to... not, it should be mentioned, though, uh, you know, an opportunity for the kind of interactions one would have at a convention because it is Correct. a moose ticket. We have to discourage people from asking for autographs or taking selfies. That's it's right. all about the flow and the movement and being part of an event. Mm -hmm. We so want to. Oh yeah, go go sorry. I'll say this is definitely a chance to help out, not to just schmooze. And that you're you're there because you really, really want to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. and I think it's showing solidarity and the power that we have as the labor movement, even if you are you're part of that, right? Like everybody is part of the labor movement in one way or the other. And that just shows how strong we are and having the fans there would mean the world to everybody. Um just make sure to, uh, something I want to make sure to mention is we want to be respectful to everybody and, you know, don't write bad words on your sign and stuff like that. If you're going <laughs> to make your sign, <laughs> find creative ways to to go around that, even though we'd like to say certain things. <laughs> I, uh, the other thing I think people could do is, is if, you know, if you're on social and you want to spread the word, that would be great. Um it would be wonderful to make sure that your friends and acquaintances, particularly obviously you know anybody in California or New York, are aware of this. Again, it's the West Coast in front of the Paramount Gates at 10 to noon on the 8th this Friday and in New York at 1515 Broadway from 930 to noon. Uh, spread the word, folks. And if, and if you can't come, we have the SAG-AFTRA Foundation which has been helping families affected by the strike. You could always contribute something to them. It's sagaftra.foundation. Um, they do great work year round. They are swamped right now with need. As you can imagine, it's been months and weeks since people have gotten paychecks and uh, you know, it's hurting. It's hurting a lot of fa working families. So they're there to support and help people pay their rent and put food on the table. So if you can afford to give anything to them, it would be a great way to contribute to our cause. Everything we just talked about is going to be in the show notes on my website, aaronbosick.com. Like I said, if you're getting this episode fresh off the internet, you have about 24 hours to make your way to either New York or to LA. Guys, I want to thank you all so much for being here. This has been a great chat. I wish we could go on because there's so much more here to unpack, but I know we really have to act fast to make this happen. 
Yeah, we, we, I think we covered the waterfront and, and can't thank you enough, Aaron, for everything you do for the community. Yeah, thank you so much, Aaron. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you guys. Glad to do it anytime. I'm glad to have any of you back. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.